Okay. Now, now tell me, we were talking before we started recording, uh, something about the surety of Christ okay. in Hebrews. Okay. Okay, I had mentioned to you, and it actually relates to my father. So one of my favorite verses um, in my 20s was uh, Hebrews 7.22. Uh, Jesus is the surety or guarantor in the more modern versions of a better covenant. But just the idea, Jesus is a surety. There's a Greek word there, enguas, um, uh, uh, and it's like a pledge. And so in the Gre general Greco-Roman world, if the word was used, you're at some kind of court case or there's an agreement, um, a transaction, an economic transaction between two people. And the one person says, if I don't pay my buddy, the surety will pay for me. Uh, and so what we would almost call a cosigner. Uh, and uh, there's a, a couple of, it's actually a, a cognate of enguas in the Proverbs several times. And it says, and it's warning you, uh, don't be a, a pledge or a cosigner if the guy you're cosigning for is, does not have good character. There's several of these uh, examples. Uh, okay, uh, back to my father now. Now, uh, I grew up in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, a poor coal mining area, uh, two hours north of where we are. My dad was a minister, uh, but he didn't make that much money. And um, I hardly knew anybody that had new cars. This is back in the 70s um, in Wilkesbury. Uh, and uh, I was fortunate enough to go to college and fortunate enough to get a job out of college. I was an engineer in my former life. And so I got this engineering job, which had a nice salary. And uh, it's about a, a month before my job's come. I'm, I'm graduating. I'm back home. I got a month before I go out to another city to get uh, my go to my engineering job. I got my offer letter and nice salary. And uh, I'm like, well, I got to buy a car because I don't have a car. Uh, and of course, I graduated from college. I never paid a light bill in my life. I never... I don't know what insurance really is, what's medical insurance, what's, you know, I was just a college student and mom and dad paid for everything pretty much. Uh, so I, we go to the dealership with my dad uh, and I'm gonna buy a new small car, but I'm gonna buy a new car. And we're in there and okay, the salesman has me drive. Okay, we're gonna pick this car. We go sit down with the salesman and I assume many of you can relate to this. You're sitting with the salesman and, uh, He's like, well, okay, how are we going to pay for this? And I pull out my little salary thing. He's like, no, nah. uh, you got to have a real job. You got to have worked in a job. I'm like, what? Because I didn't know anything about this. But my dad knew what was coming. And, and again, my dad didn't have much money. Uh, and he said, I'll, I'll co-sign for the loan. Uh, now, I found out later in life, that's not that unusual that a parent co-signs for a loan. But I had no idea about this. Uh, and it made such an impression on me that he's trusting me. And if I flounder at this engineering job, it's he's got to pay for this. Um, and in, in the Lord's providence, I did not flounder in the job. But then when I read in Hebrews 7.22, it's not just Jesus is going to be the surety if I goof up. I have goofed up. He is going to pay 100% of the car loan. Uh, and due to my love for my father, uh, that that verse has, it's heartwarming relative to Christ, and it has a little extra thing for me about uh, Reverend uh, Kara, my uh, father. That's great. Uh, you know, as we've talked about priesthood, maybe you can just say positively, what is it that a priest does? What's the benefit of the priesthood of Christ? Maybe it's related to what you've just said. Maybe we, yeah. some of the things we've already talked about, but maybe we can tease that out a bit. Yeah, and the word mediator, and actually surety, the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith 8.3 calls him, Jesus a mediator and a surety. He's a mediator in the sense he's uh, interacting both with the, the God side and uh, the man side. So he's our uh, mediator. Jesus has uh, two natures, divine nature, human nature, uh, one person. Christ. So uh, uh, Christ is our priest, and he's also our king. He's also our prophet. All three are in the book of Hebrews, although the king part, son, and the priest part are more emphasized. 
And uh, anytime he's doing one of the three, he's doing the other two, two in a backhanded way. But more specifically, uh, uh, the, the priesthood, um, it, it's this amazing way that he is, the Old Testament foresaw that we needed a priest and um, we needed a priest to offer himself. So there's all these uh, priesthood uh, cares about you. So there's a, um, we go to the throne of grace and he's a priest uh, for us there. Uh, the priest represents you. There's a whole bunch of famous uh, uh, sections, uh, uh, Hebrews 2. He has to represent you. Hence, Jesus had to be a man. He had to be eternal, hence divine, other things, but he has to represent you. So he cares about you. Uh, he represents you. And uh, there's also these statements about that Jesus also suffered like we did. And he, uh, uh, he understood our sin, but did not sin. Uh, so there's uh, that uh, angle to it. Um, there's the, he prays for us. Um, uh, you know, in his, while he was on earth, he prayed for Peter. Uh, but he prays for us in heaven. So another angle to him being a priest. Uh, now maybe the center of it is the sacrifice part of it relative to uh, our sins. But there's all other kind of angles of him being a priest that are... Uh, Again, I don't use the word heartwarming too much, but are heartwarming. Uh, so anything else on Hebrews that uh, that might be helpful to talk about? A thousand. I'm, I'm things. sure there are. Yes, <laughs> yes. But. Uh, um, uh, I'll bring up one because we, uh, Brandon and I, were at this uh, conference yesterday, and uh, your president brought up uh, uh, Hebrews seven and eight. Okay, it's chapter thirteen, Hebrews seven and eight. Uh, and in seven, it, it's a speaking eight chapter verse eight is the famous um, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the previous verse talks about uh, imitating your leaders. And in that verse, it's leaders who have recently died that were your ministers imitate their faith. Uh, and then later in the chapter, he'll talk about. Uh, your current leaders, but there, imitate your leaders who have died. And then he just goes right into Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And actually, the next verse, he says, don't follow uh, diverse, wacko doctrines. And you're like, well, what's the connection between Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever to dead leaders and to uh, doctrines? Uh, and of course, this is like a creedal statement that applies to a thousand things. Mm -hmm. And he just sticks it in there. Well, one, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the word same there is, goes back to chapter 1, where he's talking about Jesus as the creator uh, from Psalm 102, uh, but also he's the same Savior uh, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Uh, um, and so if he's the same Savior, your leaders, the life they lived was connected to Christ. He's the same that's a uh, logic of why we should be imitating other Christians. Now, ultimately, Christ is the example, but other believers with appropriate qualifications are uh, examples because it's the same Christ, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then in the next verse, talking about the uh, goofy doctrines that they were being tempted to fall into, uh, because he's the same, the doctrines of the Bible all point to Christ uh, there isn't new doctrines properly understood. Uh, they were always pointing to Christ. They still always point to Christ. And he's not changing. He's the same Christ. Uh, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Very good. And, and if, just relating that back to chapter 1, some of the clearest New Testament evidence for the divinity of Christ is right there in chapter 1. Yes, well said. Uh, First four verses are this unbelievable opening paragraph saying these amazing things. And then uh, verse 5 through the, except for the last verse, through the rest of the chapter are running to the Old Testament to prove the quotes. Uh, and uh, 
there's, in the first four verses, there's two comments about one initial Jesus related to initial creation and con then continuing providence. And then he has these amazing quotes from uh, Psalm 45, Psalm uh, 102, just explicitly saying that the God of the Old Testament is Jesus, uh, the creator. And uh, he uses the word same, and that's picked up, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, uh, yes, well said, Brandon. And and just, just to round that out, and chapter 2 then has some of the, the, the greatest reflections on the humanity of Christ yes. as well. So you have divinity and humanity of yes, Christ, very the, important for uh, And you don't know how many times I'm writing the commentary, and it'd be like, it is... Of course, I didn't say it a hundred times, but I thought it a hundred times. It is so shocking how he goes from divinity of Christ to humanity of Christ, and not just sort of divinity, sort of humanity. It is the full version of uh, divinity. I mean, just thinking Jesus died. I mean, had his human nature. Jesus suffered uh, his human nature. Um, uh, and then the whole, all the chapter two stuff of uh, uh, he's... He doesn't, he's not like angels. He's like us, humans. Uh, well said. Uh, the divinity and humanity of Christ are both uh, emphasized in the book. Well, Hebrews is a great book. I, I recommend this commentary here, a mentor commentary, Robert Kara, Bob Kara here. Uh, and uh, thank you for writing it. There's a lot of good theology here and good exegesis. And so thanks for joining us. Well, no problem. Thanks for this uh, channel that you're working on here. We're good. So I hope this has been helpful. Thanks for watching. Remember to keep it clear and focus on Christ. Amen.